Who had a great conference so far? Awesome. Cool. It is really nice to be here uh, in Prague. Uh, it's, it's such a beautiful city. I've been here before, and it's just amazing and, and such welcoming people. So it's really good to be back here uh, and to be able to tell you uh, a little bit about the stuff we do uh, most in our lives, which is write code that we uh, end up hating afterwards, right? So first of all, uh, I'm Raphael, as the uh, voice so well uh, introduced me. It would be great if this would work, actually. There we go. Um, I work at Usabilla. Usabilla is a feedback company. Uh, we're based in Amsterdam, so we... Um, there we go. Uh, essentially, you put feedback buttons on people's websites so your customers can complain about your website, and then you can fix it, which is great. Um, but that's all I'm going to say about this. Uh, to start talking about code it's in, and talking about the code we write, it's important to go back in time. Now, if you go back in time, you will meet, um, you know, little Rafael. Little Rafael started coding, little kid living back in Brazil, and little Rafael had no idea what he was doing. He was writing code without tests. You know, we didn't even know what tests were back then. Right? This is back in PHP 3, PHP 4 days. And, and if I look back at all the stuff that I did back then, and I'm, I'm proud of some of the stuff I did that because, you know, you're learning. But I also have this reaction to everything I did back then, right? It's like, what was I thinking, right? And then sometimes you look at this code and you look at the old repositories and you go look at some of the code that your friends wrote on a day-to-day -day basis and you have these reactions, you know, like, what is this? What, what am I looking at, right? I mean, how many of you feel like this every day when you look at someone else's code? Right? Like, what were they thinking, right? Or, or, or the all famous one where you go, well, I mean, you're all wearing the shirt, right? Who did this? Oh, oh, wait, that was me yesterday, right? And then we have this natural uh, developer instinct of we're going to rewrite all of it, right? Because we're all the best developers in the world, right? No? Okay, cool. <laughs> but we, we can't live like that, right? If, if everyone that comes in would simply wipe out what everyone else did before them and start from scratch, then we wouldn't be anywhere, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't get stuff done. So there's a saying that real developers ship stuff. Sure, that's, that's what we're here to do. Right? We're being paid to deliver code. We're being paid to deliver value to our customers. Now, that sounds great. You know, just going around and saying, yeah, yeah, you know, what you're saying is great about quality, but we need to ship. Okay, it's fair, we do need to ship. But is it that black and white? Is it that easy? So, how many of you, anyone from the US? All right, cool, you may know this one then. Oh, hey, Erasmus, you've heard this twice. <laughs> so, in the US, um, in Seattle, there used to be a, there, there, there still is a river over there, uh, and they built a bridge to cross it. It's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Now, they, they had this river, they had to get from one side to the other, so they thought, what do we do? Well, we build a bridge. So they're like, okay, well, let's just build a bridge that goes from one side to the other, as straightforward as it can be, and, you know, it's simple. Build bridges, you know, you just put up the two stakes, you do that, and you're done. <sighs> so they did that. That was back in November 1940. Four months later, the wind picked up in that area. So, um, look, I'm an engineer and I'm pretty sure bridges should not do that, <laughs> right? So what happens is the wind picked up in the area, which was an unexpected phenomenon apparently, they didn't look into it, and, and this started happening. It started resonating with the frequency of the bridge and it started shaking and then, can you imagine if this is your website, all of a sudden you get more users on your website, more traffic, and all of a sudden everything is going down, and now Nadja's is, then you're getting, you know, messages and, and DMs on Slack, and everything is going down, everything is burning. It's the same thing, right? If you don't think about what you're building, you run the risk of not being ready for what can happen to it afterwards. Now, happily, no one died from this incident, except a dog. So bad code actually kills puppies. Think about that. Right? So it's great. Just, you know, just shipping is not enough. You need to be aware of these things. So how do we find that balance? How do we strike a balance between writing code that is going to last, that we're going to be able to use and maintain for years to come, uh, and still deliver? Right? We need to find that balance. Because if we strive for the perfection of code all the time, we will not deliver, and you know, we're going to go bankrupt. 
But if we don't care about what we write every single time, then you know, every, every new day when you want to do something else to that code, you're going to have that urge to go back and write it from the beginning. So we need to find a balance. So in, in, in 18 years of career and looking at all these things, I found that code actually has like an expiration date to it. Right? There's no way to get around this. Code is like you know, cheese. If you leave it out of the fridge for too long, it becomes gorgonzola. That was a horrible joke, I know. But code is a perish perishable thing. It will it'll start rotting away. That's just the nature of code, because it's something that is constantly changing, constantly something evolving. Because that's also what code does, it evolves. New features come around, new ideas, new patterns, new ways of solving problems. Right? Languages that we use also evolve. I mean, look at what PHP 7.3 is today, and look at what PHP 3 was back then. It's a big difference. There's a lot of new features, and we, you know, we're developers. We like the new and shiny. We like to use new features because they make our work easier, or they make our work better, or they give us more confidence in what we're doing. But apart from just the code and the language, you evolve as well. So the fact that you hate what you did in the past, or that you look at it and you say, you could have done, you could have done something better, means that you evolved. You learned something new. You now went to a conference and you learned about new strategies. You learned about event storming. You learned about DDD. All of these things have an impact in you, and you evolve. So actually, if you don't regret some of the stuff that you have done in the past or think that you can do it better, you have not evolved. And we need to continue evolving. So it's kind of a counterintuitive thing, right? You actually want to look back at your stuff and say, I could have done better, because it means that you know how to do it better now. But again, we need to find that balance of how do we maintain it? How do we keep moving forward? Because the problem with bad code is not that it just is ugly. The problem is that it resists change. It you know, adds risk to change. And you want to reduce those uh, elements so that you can make changes and not you know, go through the usual process of, of, of suffering while you're doing it. So a couple of things that I've found uh, that really add to the scenario are things like complexity. If your code is just naturally complex, it's harder to read. I mean, have you ever tried to pick up text that someone else wrote? If they decided to use their own structure of text, it becomes really hard to understand if it's a different language, if it's something else. Right? Code is essentially text. We're reading code, and we're interpreting, and we're understanding it. So it's very important, if you want someone else to understand what you wrote, to have something that is simple, that is easier to comprehend. Uh, the other thing is bad design. If you just use bad design, you know, the code is naturally going to resist change in the future. And we've all done this. Um, as, as developers who work for clients, the other thing we suffer a lot from is just bad specs. Right? The beginning of any project is the moment in which you least know about what you're going to build. I mean, who here has a client that has walked through your door and described exactly what he wants, and when you deliver it a year later, it was still exactly the same thing? Yeah, I figured, no hands go up, right? Things change, clients change, ideas change. How do we resist these things? How do we adapt, right? This is what most of our studies uh, have gone into the past few years. Uh, the other aspect that really um, I find hurts a lot of teams, and I heard this even recently, is what they call NIH. NIH. Does anyone know what NIH is? Not invented here, right? It's the urge to resist any software that is not your own and rewrite it, right? It's, a, it's essentially what the Germans call everything else. Just don't, just don't try and build anything, right? Just build your own self. Um, but that's the thing, right? NIH really is really a problem for us because instead of being able to focus on your own domain, on what makes what you're building unique, you're now focusing on building all these things that people have done better. Like, how many of you have tried to write uh, an ORM? Marco, keep your hand up. <laughs> right? How many of you regretted it? <laughs> right? And how many of you decided, hey, I'll just use Doctrine? Right? There's a reason for that, because if you try to build your, your own ORM, sure, you're going to learn a lot, but you're also going to make the same mistakes that Doctrine made, until you fix them, hopefully. And if they haven't fixed it yet, just talk to Marco, he'll do it. But 
I do come here today. Brothers and sisters, I have come with the solution. Many years. I have searched high and low, and I have found the silver bullet. And you can get it if you buy my book for only $15.99. No, sorry. <laughs> so the sad news is, there is no solution. And that's it. It's over, okay? You can go for lunch now. It's great. <laughs> no, I mean, there is no silver bullet. If anyone tries to sell you a silver bullet, they're lying. There is no way, one single way to do this. But there are plenty of ideas that we can explore, learn from, and try that will make our day-to-day -day lives easier. It won't make us never you know, hate the code we wrote in the past, but it will make us come to peace with code being, you know, having to change in the future. So a couple of ideas. I mean, first of all, to improve code, um, you need to make it easier to comprehend. Right? If you make that code easier to understand, it's easier for someone else to pick it up. It's easier for more people to collaborate. And the great thing about working with teams is that it's no longer just your problem. It's now a shared thing. You've got more people who can help you. Right? It's really good to help, be able to hand things over to someone else and not have to be the only person involved in it. Bus factor is a real thing. Um, you need to make code flexible. Again, the struggle we have with code is that it resists change. And change is the nature of the software uh, the market. Code changes, like requests, specs, everything changes all the time. And, and, and we need the code to be able to react to this better. The other thing is you need to make, you know, make it tested. You need to have tests. Tests are really important for that. Uh, again, Make it easier to replace, make it easier to refactor. Because change is going to be there. You need to be able to make it more modular. And then finally, you need to make it not exist. Guarantee you, if you are looking for a silver bullet of how to make you know, the code be perfect, just don't write it. That's it. It's like security. You, know, you unplug your computer, that's security. Done. So the more you can use someone else's code, the more you can use code that has already been out there, you know, the less you have to worry about the things that you're creating, and you, know, you can rely on an entire community. So let me talk to you about a couple of these things and introduce something that personally uh, has really changed how I code a lot in, 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 in general. First of all, testing. Who here is not testing? Ah, oh, that's awesome. No hands up, really good. I mean, if you ask this, what, five to ten years ago in, in, in a PHP conference, it would be the opposite, right? Barely any hands would go up. But now, there is no excuse. We've got so many testing tools, so many amazing testing tools to help us. So there is no excuse for not testing. But now, what is testing about? Do you think testing is about making sure the code is right? No? Do you think testing is about confidence? There you go, I see the hands up. Exactly. Testing is all about confidence. It's not about, oh, is the code working correctly? It's about giving you the confidence that that code is doing what you expect it to do. Giving you the confidence that if you need to go make changes, you're not breaking something else. It's allowing you to make changes, allowing you to give that, you know, it's giving that code the flexibility that you needed to have. Because refactoring is part of the TDD cycle, right? You know, green, red, refactor, make it better. That's, that's part of our flow. And the thing is, refactoring without tests is kind of like you know, playing Jenga. If you're refactoring your code and you don't have a test to guarantee that it's still working, it's like playing Russian roulette. You need to have that confidence to be able to make changes. Second thing is one of those loose concepts, right? Good design practices. I think you've heard about them all over the place, and you probably heard a bunch of them here in the conference. Uh, if we learn good design practices, good ideas to collaborate with each other, um, things are going to get better. Things like uh, solid and stupid, right? Anyone not heard of solid or stupid? All right, a couple of names. Uh, I mean, they're just practices that are really good for making code more decoupled, more easy to work with, right? And if you look up solid or stupid anywhere, uh, you can get all of the details I would not have. You, know, there's a, you can give an entire talk on that subject. And, and it will really uh, contribute to a lot of these things. Um, design patterns. Design patterns are not a good thing. Why are design patterns good? You don't have to know them all by name. Personally, I don't even know half of them by name. But the idea of a design pattern is that it's a pattern. It means that 
It's something that has been used and proven by other people, and it's something that people are probably familiar with. And that's really important when you're working within a team, that you're creating something that your colleague can actually understand. I mean, you can be the most brilliant of developers. You can write this amazing code with your own design patterns, and you can come up with all these new things, and then no one in your team understands what you did. Now, is that going to be good? I mean, if you're looking for job security, that's one way to get it. But it's not really collaboration, right? It, then you're stuck there forever trying to deal with that. So you want things that are easier to understand. And design patterns are exactly that. They're this common knowledge that we can all benefit from. Um, the other one has been really famous in the PHP community is uh, domain-driven, right? We've, we've come to the realization that domain-driven actually applies to what we do. Uh, and there's been an uptick in, in, in the amount. So, I mean, this stuff is back from the 70s, but we're now you know, rehashing and finding that again. And ideas like, like, uh, like, like, like domain-driven really help you focus a lot on what's important, what's unique about your code. Instead of writing that thing that everyone has already figured out, focus on the stuff that's important for your company, for your business, for your clients. Like, you know, if you're a company that's doing e-commerce, then uh, maybe you're not going to innovate in uh, user registration. Maybe you can use an off-the-shelf system like uh, Off0 or something else. But you can focus on the user experience in the store and that kind of stuff. So understanding your domain is critical to understanding what you can completely ignore or pull off the shelf. Uh, other things that are coming up uh, along with DDD is a lot of these modular architectures and, and different approaches, things like CQRS uh, and event sourcing that give you alternate ways of handling uh, the same data, right? We're no longer only building CRUD systems where we take data, save it to the database, bring it back and do something. There's different ways of approaching this. Now, there's nothing wrong with CRUD, but there's also understanding what are the options that you have. Right? Things like CQRS allow you to deal with scale in so many different ways. Uh, things like events, uh, event sourcing allow you to deal with security and, and auditing logs, for example, in completely different ways than a CRUD system would. So understanding each of these ideas and trying to implement them in the best way or, or choose them in the right places um, can make you, you know, can give you that flexibility of reacting to change in the future. Uh, another one, which if you saw Gabriel's uh, talk this morning, is strict programming. Right? PHP is becoming this amazing language with type hints and return types and type properties. Uh, we can use strong typing, which allows us to start using more of the uh, strict programming approach, right? making sure that your code is actually doing what you expect it to do. And then finally, package managers. Right? Because on one hand, we have NIH, non-invented here, on the other hand, we have PI, which stands for Proudly Invented Elsewhere. Right? That's, that's what the essence of package managers are, using packages from people who have done this before, uh, using packages from communities that have put so much effort into it that you're not going to have to. Like, like I was talking about doctrine. What is the advantage of using doctrine? It's like you've got a whole bunch of people there who are using it, contributing it, and finding the bugs before you do. It's like you're getting a free you know, labor force. People are already fixing the bugs that you're going to run into in the future. Sure, you might run into a couple of them because you're running an edge case, but then you can fix it, and the next one will benefit from that. So it's this endless cycle that just helps everyone. So really, using other packages is really good. Um, so I was talking about code being you know, text. It's, it's, it, you read code, right? And readability is also really important. Paragraphs and white spaces, I, they sound like something that's not really that important to what we're doing. But, you know, code reads just like reading a book. You need to make it, you know, better formatted. Separating things into blocks, it's like putting paragraphs. I mean, have you ever picked up a text on Facebook and it's just this big blob of text? No dots, no commas, no paragraphs, no anything. It starts getting confusing to read. Same thing with code. If you just jump it all up together, it's really hard to read. So the next person who picks up that code is going to go, oh, what's going on here? So these are some general ideas, things that are uh, interesting that you might have heard of uh, already in the past. Uh, but in researching this a couple of years ago, uh, we ran into an interesting, um, interesting new solution. And it was called object calisthenics. Has anyone ever heard of object calisthenics? All right, cool. So object calisthenics was uh, uh, um, 
an essay written by Jeff Bay in the uh, book uh, Fortworth Ontology. And it was a set of exercises to help you write better object-oriented code. All right, so it's essentially these guidelines that you can follow to improve the quality of, of your object-oriented code over time. Now, calisthenics means, uh, you know, if you, if you go to the gym, calisthenics is the repetition of, of work that you do there, like, you know, doing the, the reps on, a, on, 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 you know, checking, doing the, the biceps workout. It's like, in order to do, you do lots of small little exercises to have this big gain at the end. And calisthenics is that, is lots of small little practices to have this big gain at the end, which is better uh, object-oriented code. Again, these are exercises, very important, not rules. So, um, I used to work with um, a team called the SWAT team back in South Africa, and we were looking for a way to improve the quality of what we wrote, but also improve the quality of the code that we traded with the companies within our group. So we were essentially consulting within a big group. And together with uh, Guilherme Blanco, who you may know from uh, Doctrine, uh, and Otavio Ferreira from uh, Amazon, we, we ran into this essay by, by, by Jeff Bay. And we found them very interesting, so we adapted them back then to, to PHP, to the reality. These were written originally for Java, and PHP is still very different from Java. Um, so we found these rules, we adjusted them, we made them a lot less strict, uh, because that was the reality of PHP. Um, but then, something happened. So I've been talking about calisthenics for, I don't know, going on five to six years. And the current set of rules that I want to show you, so I'm going to show you ten, ten exercises to help you. Um, they're now back to the original strictness of the Java approach. Because PHP has evolved that much. Right? PHP has come to a moment where we can actually start looking at these things and being a bit more strict with ourselves. So I'm going to introduce you to these ten exercises just as ideas for you to try out. Uh, it's something that changed how I code. Like I started doing this uh, seven years ago and I just started looking at the code in a different way. It all became a lot simpler and a lot easier to approach. So the first exercise is to only write code that has a single level of indentation. No more than one level, right? So if you break into a function, then everything stays within that or one level deeper. So no for eaches, inside for eaches, inside for eaches. I mean, just don't do that in general, but you know, this is, um, there's um, one of these uh, uh, memes on the internet, the uh, Ryu doing the Hadouken and you're seeing the indentation of code. That's what we're trying to avoid. Now, this is pretty simple, right? Because the idea is the more that you start indenting, the more that you start going within other blocks, you're essentially doing more things in that method, which means your method is no longer following uh, the S of solid, which is the single, um, single responsibility principle, right? Where you're only doing one thing in that method. You want your methods to be small, lean, and do that one thing. So this limitation, again, this is an exercise, not a rule, um, really starts giving you that control. Like if every time you feel you're going more, you know, deeper into that indentation level, well, maybe stop and go back. Cool. Second one, and uh, this is where usually people start throwing stuff at me, so just, just yell so I can dodge. Don't use else. Okay, cool. No one threw anything? That's good. How many of you think that's like, what is this guy doing on stage? A couple of you. Okay, cool. Yeah, Marco. All right. And. And that's fine, because that is exactly the reaction I had when we started trying to apply this rule. I'm like, what is wrong with else? It's a nice word. It's a really fine construct, right? You do this or you do that. It's great. <sighs> so I really resisted it a lot in the beginning. And then I started looking into, OK, what, what, what are we trying to achieve with this exercise? What are we trying to teach ourselves in doing this? Uh, and it really did change. Like, I haven't written an else for a very long time. I mean, there might be a couple of else's there if you go look at, the, at, at some code. But in general, it just, I no longer need to use them. So if we look at this code, and this is essentially Symfony code, if you're familiar with Symfony from five years ago or something, um, we're trying to create a post, like a blog system, right? And in here, we see that it's doing a couple of things, right? 
it's, it's validating stuff and it's, it's trying to save to the database. But essentially, what you're actually trying to do with this method is to create the post, right? It's save something in the database. That is the actual goal of this method. Everything around it is business rules, infrastructure, details that will contribute to that goal, but are not the goal of that method. So, like most of this stuff here is just error handling. But if you look at this method the first time, it takes you a while to figure that out. There's a lot of stuff in there. So if we start thinking, okay, how can we get rid of the else's and how can that help us? We, we go back to the original code and say, okay, well, we'll just get rid of the else's. Straightforward, get rid of the else's. And that's kind of what it looks like. We're now handling very specific scenarios. Like if you look at the first one here, uh, this is now an exit condition. So if the form is not valid, stop. I will not create a post if the data that you're sending me is not valid. That's a business rule. It's in the business variant. Cool. Then we see the other one. The other one here is, well, you know, if it already exists in the database, then don't add it again. Exit. Now, does this controller method need to handle all of those scenarios? Does it need to do all these things? Or can it simply say, I am not creating this post and toss it all out? Right? Instead of having all of these branches within your code, you start seeing a clearer pattern. And I'll get to that in a bit. So if we think about it, this is what a method essentially does, right? It, it'll create the uh, method. So let's start getting rid of all these things. There's more, more information here that we don't need. So let's try and get rid of more stuff. I don't need to handle all of those errors. I can just do this, right? And then I can wrap it with middlewares. How many of you were in Marco's talk yesterday, right? Middlewares. So now, instead of having to do these things myself, I just have middlewares around this that will do the validation, that will check if things exist. And now my method is really doing that one thing, and that one thing very well, right? PSR7 is really cool for these things. But what you're having here is originally we had all of these branching thoughts within our method that really added to the complexity of trying to understand it, right? If you look at lexers and compilers, how they go through code, it's essentially the same way that our brain goes through code, right? You start going down one line, then you, oh, it's going to be either this or this. If I go here, then I have, and you start having to keep all of those conditions in your head. And it gets complicated. We start just browsing over the code and losing the detail. You want your code to be straightforward. If you stop using else's, what you end up is you're able to create a blog post, a, a method that does one thing, and it's right there described, and everything else becomes an exit point. These are all the exceptions. These are all the things that will cause me to not do what I'm supposed to do with this method. And then in looking at that method, your colleague can go and say, well, this method creates the post. It will not do it in these kind of scenarios. Right? It's very straightforward and easier to read. And if you start applying it on a day-to-day -day basis and using things like early returns, you start seeing uh, these benefits of the simplicity of that code. Now, whether you want to use early returns or not is a whole other discussion that we can have for at least an hour at the bar. Uh, but personally, uh, especially with PHP, I think it's, it's something that can be used. It's a very powerful tool that you can have in your arsenal. Cool. Number three, wrap primitives if they contain behavior. So what is this about, right? Instead of having all your code being um, just thrown over uh, in a functional way, in a pro pro procedural way, uh, you know, you start creating these things. So for example, if we take this example of code here, we have a component that has a method called repaint that receives false. Wait, so don't repaint? Or wh wh what is that false, right? I mean, if you look at this call, you, you have no idea what's going on. What is that false about? You have to go look at the signature of the method to understand what's going on there. Now, instead of passing in a scalar, if we wrap that in an object that represents the domain rule or whatever it's being expressed there, uh, we can have something like this. Replace, new, animate, false. So now you can actually say, oh, okay, so repaint without animating. Okay, that's easier. That's much easier for it to understand without having to go look at that method signature. And, and these little things are places where you can start 
giving it more clarity, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you look at DDD and you talk about uh, aggregates and aggregate routes and, and keeping that information, uh, keeping your models constant and not violating business rules, these are things that can really help you uh, go through that. Also, now you have this object animate. And if you go look at what happened before, what was the method doing? It was repainting and animating, so it was doing two things already. Right? Now you can take all of those animation things, put it in the animate class, let the animate class do about it, and the repaint class just does its thing and lets the animation class kick in and do whatever it needs to. It's a really weird example for PHP, but the idea is that you can start handing these things off. How many of you work with money in your code base? Right? It's fun, right? Floats and, and all these business rules. How many of you use floats while handling money? Okay. How many of you have regretted doing that in the past? Okay, cool. <laughs> Just checking. Um, but what can you do? Like, you know, here's, a, here's a good example of instead of having that scalar value, that float or that integer, please make it be an integer, um, Instead of having that thing and just handle it, you can use something like uh, money. Nice library. It'll do all of the figuring out for you, turning numbers, integers into bigger integers so you can only deal with integers and not floats and all that stuff. And you don't have to know about all this. You just know that you're creating five euros and you're adding uh, five euros. You're creating 500 euros and you're adding five euros to it. Right? Again, you're taking out those concerns of dealing with the transformations of floats and everything else, and putting it off to a side so you don't have to worry about it. All right, number four, only one arrow per line. Oh, this used to be one dot per line if you're from Java. Uh, and the idea is you have something like this, where you start calling something, then you call something else, then you call something else, and you keep calling. Now, I am not against fluent interfaces. This is not what this is about. What this is about is uh, the, uh, the the, the meter's law, right? You're starting to look into too many things. Now, who works with Symfony here? How many of you have seen this line? Can anyone tell me what the hell is going to go wrong here? Yeah, this guy here returns null, right? If there is no token, if you're not, if you're not in a security context, this thing will return null. And um, if you call null on, a, if you call on a method on something that is null. Yeah, fatal error and everything blows up, right? Again, you're looking into all these things. You're, you know, you're, not, you're not supposed to be looking past that first call. So just don't change things. <sighs> Number five, don't abbreviate. I personally love this one because we love abbreviating. We are very lazy developers and abbreviating makes us feel good. Now, if you have an awesome idea like PHP Storm, then you probably already got away with this because then you, know, you can write really long uh, variables and it actually auto-completes. But abbreviating is a real problem. For example, observe this beautiful code. Now, this is real code. Huh? This is someone, someone sent, me, sent this to me uh, many years ago. What the hell is this? What is this? I mean, uh, there's an NY. Is that New York? SX, South, Southwest, some, I don't know, what, that, what, what is this, right? Now, it turns out this is uh, image manipulation, and the hint here is the string sys mat image, W. So it's probably about image width. But how long did it take you to figure it out from just looking at that code? Like, did it really compensate all the time that you were not writing long variable names? Also, if you want short variable names, this is not short. It's just, no, right? It's really complicated. If you start abbrevi abbreviating things everywhere, it loses that context. It's, you, know, you, you need to remember that code is a conversation between you and your colleagues. Now, when you wrote this, I bet you feel like a genius, <laughs> right? I put all of this information into these characters, and it's great. And then tomorrow you read that variable and you have no idea what it was, right? That's the same way your colleagues are going to look at it. It's like, what, what is this? What are you trying to say, right? So use that variable to communicate with other people. Even better, try to find synonyms. Try to really understand the words and give them meaning. Like if you have a method that says get page, 
right? If you, if you have a method and it says get page, you're like, okay, it's a getter. It doesn't cost anything, right? But what about if that method actually downloads the page using curl from a server in Singapore? Are you going to call that method five times in a row? No, you're probably going to cache the result because you understand that it has a cost. So instead of calling it get page, call it download page or fetch page. At the very least, someone reading the code will go, okay, this is not a getter. There's something else to it. Why? What is there? Right? So you can pass a lot of that information just by picking good variable names. Number six, keep your classes small. Now, I'm not even going to go into this. It just, you know, just keep your stuff small. You want simple? It should do one thing. If it does one thing, it will be small. If in doing one thing, you have a class that has 2,000 lines of code, then uh, that thing is too big. Figure out what it is, small, you know, shrink it. Make more classes. It's not really going to cost you that much performance to have 50 classes. It will give you the benefit of being able to go exactly where you need to go to make exactly the change you want. Uh, the other one is limiting your instance variables to two. Two. Does anyone not know what an instance variable is? A couple of confused faces. So an instance variable is the property of an object where you store the, uh, an instance of another object, right? So if you have something like this, uh, you have a registration service, and in there you have the user service, the password service, the logger, the translator, the, yeah, a lot of stuff, right? The idea is keep this small, because then you're going to spread out that work amongst different things, or maybe even think, do I need to do this now? Like, if this is a registration service, do I really need this um, image cropper in here? Is it, is it really important that I crop the user's avatar at the moment the user is registry? Or is it more important to say, here, you're registered, we're working on your picture? Right? These choices become a lot more apparent when you start forcing yourself to not have all of these you know, chains, all of these extra uh, properties. Right? And then you can start saying, well, you know, instead of, well, I mean, why do I have a user service and an entity manager? You know, why do I have a repository? Why don't I have a repository that does all this? Why don't I use middlewares to do logging? Do I really need to handle translation on this level? Right? So really think about what you need in there and try to reduce uh, that graph. Um, using first class collections is also a really good idea. Um, hopefully one day we'll have collections in core, even if it's going to hit our performance uh, badly. Um, hopefully we find a way to, to provide some of the instructions because it then allows you to deal with collections as collections and not oh, this is a group of this, this is a group of that, and now I'm trying to manipulate, how do I iterate over these things, oh, oh, I need to, right? Arrays are great in PHP, they're very powerful, but they also can uh, make us very confused. So trying to use objects like Doctrine's array collection already gives you the advantages of having all of the collection methods simply available. It's a collection. I don't care what it is, it's a collection of things. They all have the same ways of iterating collections. Number nine, don't use getters and setters. <laughs> yeah, so originally when we uh, adapted this from Java, we said use getters and setters. That's because Doctrine relied on them, and uh, Guilherme didn't want to piss off everyone. Um, but since then, and domain driven coming through and all these things, I started rethinking this. I'm like, you know what? Don't use getters and setters. I mean, I'm not telling you to ban them, but I'm telling you try to avoid using a getter and setter. When you're trying to get information from an object, because that's what a getter does, think about other ways of doing it. I mean, setters are obvious, right? Immutable objects. They don't work everywhere. They're not meant to be used everywhere. But immutability gives you a lot of assurance. Like you're creating something, it will stay the way it is until it doesn't. That's fine. And then for getters, like for example, imagine this code, right? You're trying to get the score and set the score of a player on a game or something. And then here you're saying, well, in order if someone just did something and now I'm going to give them a point, you're now getting that value and you're setting that value. This now means that anywhere in your code base, someone who does not understand your domain can give a user a point when they just shouldn't get a point, right? Now, 
I'm not saying that the people you work with are not to be trusted. That's not right. But the less you can allow mistakes to happen, the less conflict you're going to have as a team, the less conflict you're going to have as, 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 as software in general. right? So instead of using this, if we say, well, collect coin. That's what I did. I did collect coin, and that means uh, I should get one point. Now, for someone interacting with this object, you're no longer just you know, doing whatever you want with the object and keeping the business rules spread out throughout your code. Now the player, or the, the, the score tracker, or whatever this function is going to be, has all of these rules. It understands that a coin means one point. So when you decide, well, coins are now worth 10 points, there's one place to change, not 50 different places which you need to go find. So you know, just little things. Start thinking about domain in that way, and, and then try to avoid. With, with type properties, this whole thing may become completely different, because then we don't need to get incentives for type checking which is still a valid case uh, for what you're doing in some cases, then uh, you know, we can start even easier uh, following these. And then finally, document your code. Now, I don't mean going to an if and saying, here we're going to choose between A and B. <laughs> That's what if means. Like I said, code is text. Just read the text. If this, then that. Right? But this is where you want to transfer information between yourself and the next person that is really relevant, that's really important for what they're doing. So this is the point where you want to tell people, hey, uh, this method has a cost of, oh, whatever. This method has a, you know, all of these extra informations, these tidbits that would be important. Like, for example, sometimes you're going to have to write horrible code. There's a reason, maybe, why you're writing horrible code. For example, has anyone ever looked at the unit of work on Doctrine? <laughs> it's not the most beautiful code in the world, but there's a reason for it. If you go talk to anyone in there, or if you go look at the class itself, it will state it right there. This code runs millions of times every time you do something with Doctrine. You want it to be fast, so that's okay. That's a moment in which you're saying, look, I'm going to forego readability for performance. That's a trade-off. It's a trade-off that you understand. And your documentation can help you pass that information along. Because the first thing that's going to happen when the new developer who's very eager to contribute to your project comes in is going to go, oh, this is horrible. I'm going to rewrite it. Then you're going to reject their PR, and they're going to be sad. But if up front they understand why, what's going on in here, why do we do it this way, why don't we do it that way, then you can avoid that whole thing. Another great thing for this is uh, ADRs, Architectural Decision uh, Records, where you just record these big architectural uh, changes or decisions that you made and avoid having to discuss them all the time over and over. So, all right. Those are 10 rules, not rules, exercises. I keep saying rules, but they're exercises. And you've been here for two days, three days at the conference learning all these things. So now it's your turn. Take all this information that you learned at the conference and put it to action. It's no use if you come here, you listen to all this, and you go back to doing the same thing over and over. Monday, tomorrow, get to the office and start seeing what can you do better. Work on improving yourself. Learn more. Go, continue going to conferences. Find your local user group. Talk to people online. Contribute to open source. These are really great ways of learning things that you don't have access to on a day-to-day -day basis within your work environment. Read code. Just go through GitHub and look at code. It's the only way that you can tell the good code from the bad code is if you've seen enough of it. Right? If all you see in your life is bad code, then you don't know what good code is because that's good code for you. Right? So you need to change, you need to get that different perspective. So just read code. That's open source is really good for this. You can look at all of these amazing projects with so many good people working on them and get perspective, understand what are they doing different? What are we doing different? Why are we not doing these things? Just write simpler code. Try object aesthetics for one month in your personal project. Just find a pet project and try these exercises. Try writing code with, with, with these things in mind. The idea is not that you're breaking rules. It shouldn't be a PHP CS fixer thing or anything like that. It should just be something that you keep in your mind and then it'll, it'll change the way you think about code. It'll change the way 
that you perceive the complexity of your code, right? At least it did that for me. I know at least a couple of people who, uh, who, who were also uh, improved by it. So just give it a go. Give it a go. Try it at the office, try it in a pet project, and see what happens. But be part of this community. Share libraries. Composer is right there. Share more. Open, open source some of your stuff. Is it, is it something crucial to your business? Sure, keep it private. Is it something generic other people can benefit from? Open it up. Open it up to this community. I mean, we've got amazing people in the PHP community. Everyone is eager to help us out. Everyone is eager to, you know, fix your bugs and give you ideas and write enhancements. I mean, how many of you have been doing the uh, Hacktoberfest uh, project from uh, DigitalOcean and GitHub? Oh, we need more of you. Just go out there and just play around with code. Use more of other people's code. Help them with that code and then share your, share your code in return. But more than that, you've been here in this conference and you've seen so many things. Take those things to heart. You've learned about DDD, auto wiring, contributing to PHP, writing secure code, strict types, collecting elephants. I mean, so many things that you've learned here. Take them, take them home. Do something about this Monday. Don't wait. Don't wait until the best time comes in. Just, just come in on Monday. Look at what you're doing on Monday. The first task you pick up. Can I use something that I've learned? Can I change how I do stuff today? Just take that first step. I guarantee you, you're not going to regret it. Thank you very much. <laughs>